these scriptures. The New Testament lesson is actually Luke 9, 28 through 36. So, Luke 9, 28 through 36 will be the gospel lesson. So our first lesson today is from the Old Testament. It's found in the book of Exodus, the ninth chapter, the 28th through 36th verses. Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and as he came down from the mountain with the two covenant tablets in his hand, Moses didn't realize that the skin of his face shone brightly because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw the skin of Moses' face shining brightly, they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called them closer. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and Moses spoke with them. After that, all the Israelites came near as well, and Moses commanded them everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went into the Lord's presence to speak with him, Moses would take the veil off until he came out again. When Moses came out and told the Israelites what he had commanded, what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see that the skin of Moses' face was shining brightly. So Moses would put the veil on his face again until the next time he went to speak with the Lord. And now our gospel lesson for today is found in the book of Luke, the ninth chapter, the twenty-eighth through thirty-sixth verses. Let's hear what the Lord has to say to us today. After eight days, after Jesus said these things, he took Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes flashed white like lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They were clothed with heavenly splendor and spoke about Jesus' departure which he would achieve in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were almost overcome by sleep, but they managed to stay awake and saw his glory as well as the two men with him. As the two men were about to leave Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he didn't know what he was saying. Peter was still speaking when a cloud overshadowed them. And as they entered the cloud, they were overcome with awe. Then a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Even as the voice spoke, Jesus was found alone. They were speechless. And at the time, told no one what they had seen. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I love the mountains. I love the ocean, too, but because the mountains are a little in closer proximity to us, I like to run there anytime I need a little escape. I love the sunsets and the sun rises over the mountain peaks at the top of the world. And when I need to recharge my batteries, that's where I go. I go to the mountains. I think I love the mountains because it is so multi-seasonal. In the summer, when it's hot down here, you can escape and go to the mountains. And for every thousand feet we climb up there in elevation, we drop some temperature and it gets a little cooler. Maybe making it a little more bearable in the heat of the summer. Then in the fall, the mountainsides burst forth with all the colors in God's palette. God's brush sweeps across, back and forth, across the peaks and the valleys, providing us with some of the most beautiful scenery available. And I have to admit that I'm a little prejudiced about that time of year because it was during that time that I met a certain young lady and our love began to blossom. It's no wonder that Cindy and I feel more at home in the mountains than anywhere else. 
And of course, if you're into skiing and cold weather, then there's nothing like the mountains in the winter. If you have the skills and the courage to drive up the hills after a snowstorm blows through, uh, it's beautiful and transformative experience. It's quiet, everything is blanketed with snow, and you get an opportunity, and if you get the opportunity to be there before anybody else, the snow is pristine and blindingly white. I live for those mountaintop moments. I never feel closer to God than when I'm on top of the mountain. But for anyone who's had the same experience at the mountaintop, there comes a time when you must come down from the mountain and into the valley. It's hard to come down to the valley. Perhaps you've experienced something like this in your own lives. You, you know what I'm talking about. You go away for a weekend to escape the hustle and bustle. You take a little Bible with you. You do a little devotion to God. And you truly worship while you're there, like you've never done it in years. And then you drive down the mountain when the weekend ends, secure in the knowledge that this feeling will never end. For once, you and God are one. You see things clearly, perhaps for the first time in your life. You've made a commitment that you're going to be a different person this time around. And then, wham, you're hit square in the face with life again. The silence of the weekend turns to the noise of ringing telephones, the honking of horns, traffic backups, crying babies, arguing children, and a spouse who throws the dish towel at you as she heads out of the door for the night out because she can't take being cooped up with the children anymore. Oh, and by the way, my mother is coming to town, she screams as she goes out the door, to spend two weeks with us tomorrow. As she guns the engine, she roars out of the driveway. Once you've been on the mountaintop, it's really hard to come down to the valley. Today we're going to look at two different mountaintop experiences from the Bible. The first was the Exodus passage that I just read, and then the second is from Luke. We're going to take a look at the similarities and the not-so-obvious differences between these two stories. The Old Testament lesson from Exodus 34 marks the second time that Moses has been up on Mount Sinai. The second time he brought the Lord's commandments down. When Moses returned from that first mountaintop experience to the valley below, it had disastrous results. Remember, the people had fallen into idolatry by worshiping the golden calf. And in response, it had taken 3,000 of their lives. But this time it was different. In this story, Moses is on Mount Sinai where he had just spent 40 days and nights in the Lord's presence. During that time, the Lord dictated to Moses the Ten Commandments, the law, by which all the Israelites will live. As he comes down from the mountain with the tablets of the law in his hand, Moses doesn't realize that his skin was literally glowing. Moses' face shines so brightly that all the cosmetics in his wife Zipporah's pocketbook couldn't hide the glow from his face. Moses had been in God's presence and God's glory. His Shekinah. Had, taken, had been taken into Moses' skin like a heavenly suntan. When he approached his brother Aaron and all the Israelites, the glory from Moses' brow frightened them and they wouldn't come near him. Why were they afraid? Aaron the leader of, and the leaders of all the Israelites now realize that Moses possesses a measure of holiness beyond their comprehension. To them, Moses stands at the border of heaven and earth. He embodies the very presence of God. Moses beckons them closer, and he tells them everything that the Lord had spoken to him on the mountaintop. And then we learn in verse 33 that Moses puts this veil over his face to cover his glow. Every time he goes to meet the Lord from this time on, Moses would take the veil off, and then... Upon his return to the Israelites, his skin aglow with the Lord's light, he would again cover his face with the veil after telling them God's will. Historically, in the time of Moses, priests in primitive religions would often wear masks called beards to protect the priest against demons, but also to protect the common people of, from the holiness of the priest. Also, these priests would also wear the barriers to protect him as he approached his God, lower G. But notice, because of Moses' special relationship with Yahweh, he 
He didn't have to cover his face with the veil as he approached the Lord. Only when he came back did he cover his face. In our Gospel from Luke today, we find ourselves again on the mountaintop. This story takes place about a week after Jesus and his disciples had had the discussion about Jesus' identity. Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others believe that it was one of the ancient prophets that had come back to life, they tell him. And then Jesus asks Peter, who do you say that I am? You are Christ, sent from God. And then Jesus tells them to tell no one. So James takes Peter, I mean, so Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up Mount Tabor to pray. As he was praying, Jesus' face changes and his clothes become so dazzling white that they are blinding like a bolt of lightning, we're told. Then the disciples see Jesus standing with Moses and Elijah. The fact that Moses, who represents the law, and Elijah, who represents the prophets, appear with Jesus is, is significant, for it further identifies Jesus not only as the Son of God, but God incarnate. They too were glowing with the Shekinah of God. But unlike Moses on Mount Sinai, Jesus didn't have to wear a veil over to hide God's glory because he and the Father were one. Luke tells us in verse 31 that the three were in deep discussion about Jesus' departure when he would leave Jerusalem. <coughs> Excuse me. In other words, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus were talking about his impending crucifixion. Luke is the only one to mention the topic of their discussion. He also records that the three disciples are nearly overcome with the need to sleep, which seems to imply that the transfiguration occurred at night. Luke is the only gospel writer to place the transfiguration in the dark. So imagine how blinding a sight Jesus, Moses, and Elijah would have made. As Moses and Elijah's time with Jesus draws to an end, Peter then says, Master, it's good that we're here. We should construct three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Luke says that Peter didn't know what he was saying. However, biblical scholars surmise that Peter knew exactly what he was doing. He had overheard the conversation about Jesus' mission in Jerusalem. Peter sought once again to protect Jesus as he was always trying to do. And he realized that the longer they stayed on the mountaintop, the better. They just remained where they were. With Moses and Elijah, Jesus would not have to face the death that he was so often speaking about. For Peter, James, and John, it couldn't get any better than this. But at that very moment, Peter is interrupted with, when the cloud of God's presence envelops them. They were overcome with awe as the voice of God called out to them, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Peter's desire to main, remain with Jesus on top of the Mount of Transfiguration could not stand in the way of Jesus' mission to save the world. And God himself was making sure that Peter, James, and John knew that they would have, what they may have overheard in that holy discussion had to happen. Luke tells us they were speechless and at the time told no one what they had seen. For Peter, especially coming down from that mountaintop, meant losing his closest friend. It was a long walk down. Once you've been to the mountaintop, it's hard to come down to the valley. The next day, Jesus' journey down the mountaintop to the valley meant coming from the worshipful experience of being in the presence of God to a group of unbelieving sinners. A large crowd meets Jesus, and a man from the crowd shouts, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, my only child. While Jesus, Peter, James, and John are on the mountaintop, the nine remaining disciples could not exorcise the demon from the young boy. I begged your disciples to throw it out, but they couldn't, it reads in the scriptures we didn't read today. The man's tone of voice left no doubt that his disciples' inability to handle the exorcism put Jesus in the awkward position of having to defend himself. <coughs> Just one day before Jesus was on the mountaintop, 
Now he was in the valley having to prove himself the Messiah. He had gone from hearing, this is my son, my chosen one, to hearing you claim to be the Messiah, prove it. It is no wonder that Jesus' response is less than gracious. You faithless and crooked generation, how long will I be with you and have to put up with you? He says in verse 41. It is their unbelief that cast a veil over Jesus' glory. Yet he doesn't refuse to heal the young boy. Then, of course, after Jesus proves himself worthy again, Luke records that everyone was overwhelmed by God's greatness. In 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18, which is a parallel uh, reading today, the Apostle Paul says that, the, that Moses veiled his face not because the brightness hurt his eyes or the eyes of the Israelites, but pr to protect the people from seeing how quickly the light of the mountaintop experience could fade from one's life. They were a fragile people, and Moses was offering them hope. Moreover, their disbelief would lead to the loss of the light in their hearts. So, Paul writes, since we have such a hope, we act with great confidence. We aren't like Moses, who used to put the veil over his face, that the Israelites couldn't watch the end of what was fading away, but their minds were closed. Right up to the present day, the same veil remains on the old when the old covenant is read. The veil is not removed, it is because it is taken away by Christ. Even the day when Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever someone turns back to the Lord, the veil is removed. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Lord's Spirit is, there is freedom. All of us are looking with unveiled faces at the glory of the Lord as, as if we are looking in a mirror. We are being transformed into that image from one degree of glory to the next degree of glory. This comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Jesus provides us with the same hope so that we can come down from that mountaintop to the valley below to face the challenges of our lives in today's world. Our life-changing experience on top of the mountain does not have to fade away. Yes, we can't stay on the mountaintop because there is work to be done down here in the valley. By turning to God in prayer, by reading the scriptures, by practicing the spiritual disciplines and by serving others, we can continue to have that life-changing, overwhelming, and mind-blowing relationship with God as we encounter Him on a daily basis. Amen. We now receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. Amen.